you're any of our children, uh, if y'all want to go ahead and head to Children's Church, we have that across the way. Uh, if you're not, if you're a first-time visitor with us and you have children, uh, you can of course walk over there and kind of just see where your child will be. It's a great place, great things going on. Uh, God is doing great work in our children's ministry, and um, how blessed we are as a church to have a God-honoring children's ministry. Um, I'm seeing a lot of the fruits of that with my own because they came through a children's ministry first. Uh, that and also at home, I hear everything that goes on. So I have a, my, uh, a chatty two and a half year old at home who tells all. So uh, he tells it all. So, well, welcome to Free Owen Baptist Church. My name is, sorry, I, I see Riley back there going, stop. Um, for those of you, again, who don't know me, I'm Scott Mallory. I'm your youth pastor. I've uh, been here about two and a half months now. And this is Graduate Recognition Sunday. Many of our grads have already walked the stage. They've already gotten their diploma, or at least their cover. Some of them get the diploma later. Depends on the school. If your school's better than mine, you probably already have yours. Uh, so I'll just say that. Uh, but this morning, we're going to be recognizing and commissioning our graduates. And, and in this time, there's a question that's going through their head. What is the will of God for my life? What does God want from me? Where am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to marry? When I look at Scripture, one of the first things I notice is that God's will is not as much a thing to do, but a position to be in. In 1 Samuel, you see a story of Sam, young Samuel, and he's hearing voices, and he's hearing what he believes is the Lord. He believes it's Eli, and he continues to go to Eli, yes, I'm here. And Eli says, I didn't say anything to you. Quit waking me up, Samuel. Um, or something like that. And, and we see, though, he's in a posture. And finally, as Eli, in all his wisdom, says, look, if this happens again, just answer, here I am, Lord, speak. And so Samuel hears the voice again. Here I am, Lord, speak. Christian life is not a bunch of stuff to learn. It's not a bunch of stuff to do. It's following Jesus and yielding ourselves to let Him do this in His own way. Or, I'm sorry, yielding and letting Him work in our lives in His own way. We're supposed to be in a posture of, Speak, Lord, your servant hears. But in looking for God's will and searching for God's will and trying to find God's will, I've seen people do some really silly things. Some really bad ways. So let's look at those real quick. Number one is the random coincidence method is what I call this. And, and this is the guy, an example of this is the guy who's driving down the road and he's praying, God, can you just make your will clear? Do I need to ask this girl out or not? I really like her, guys. It's your will that I date her. And he's driving down the road and he looks up and he sees a billboard. And the back of this billboard is the same color as her eyes. And the final two digits on the phone number are her age. And he thinks, Jehovah Jireh. I can't believe this. It's God's will. Men, if you are that way, stop hiding behind God and ask the girl out. He died for her. You can ask her out. Ladies, if you've been subjected to that, I'm sorry. Um, you see that in Scripture, though. We see a random coincidence happen with Jonah. Jonah is called to go to Nineveh. Jonah shows up to a ship that just so happens to be going the exact opposite direction, 300 miles of Nineveh to a town called Tarshish. And you see Jonah, huh, well, how about that? Clearly it was God's will for him to go to Nineveh. Number two is what we'll call our magic eight ball method. Everybody remember the magic eight ball? You ask the magic eight ball question, you shake it up, and the little thing inside will pop up with an answer because, you know, that's such a great thing to do is ask a little plastic eight ball. And basically this is whatever happens to come to me first, that's my answer. In other words, if I'm just sitting there thinking like, all right, God, I need you to reveal something to me right now. Oh, that's God's... A lot of times that's your deceitfully wicked heart, as Jeremiah 17, 9 would call it. Number three is the peace in your heart method. This is a very common one. Um, and I'll remind you, Eve had a great peace in her heart about eating the fruit off the tree. We have an enemy who wants us to have a... gives us a great peace about sinning. Does he not? I mean, you ever notice, like, when you sin, you're not hesitant to sin a lot of times. It's just kind of like, oh, okay, I'm just going to go do that. The enemy gives us a great peace about sin in our lives and about colossally stupid decisions because you felt at peace. Uh, and the, the opposite way, I've heard people say, well, if you don't have any peace, if you're just a train wreck in your heart about it, it's not God's will. If you are a type A analytical person like me, you're always never at peace. You're never, you're just kind of like, oh, well, what, what, if, what if this happens? Oh, what if this happens? What if it, 
and, and you've just constantly got this craziness going on inside of you. That doesn't always mean that's God saying no. In fact, that may even be Satan again trying to lie to you. I'm not saying it's always that way, but a lot of times that is Satan trying to say, hey, you, yeah, you, you don't want to do this. What are you thinking when it's, you know, God, should I, should I go share the gospel with this person or not? You know, I, I mean, how many of you are super comfortable when an opportunity to present the gospel shows up? Of course, you're nervous. This can be. Anybody is. And then, of course, finally, we call the lottery Bible. I like to call it the lottery Bible, and some people, I'm sure, don't like that term because those two things, one's evil, one's good, but... I'm kidding. But we get the lottery Bible, which is, all right, God, I need to know this answer. Oh. And you just open your Bible to something. And you've probably heard the story of the guy who says, uh, all right, God, what is your will for me today? Flips it open, turns to Matthew 27, 5. Judas hung himself. That can't be right. Let's, let's try this again. Luke 10, 37. What thou doest, do, or go and do likewise. All right, one more time. Third time's a charm. Three days, God rose. We got or Jesus rose. We got this. John thirteen twenty seven. Whatever you do, do quickly. Yeah, it doesn't work. Number one, because you naturally miss about eighty percent of the Bible when you do that. And and number two, you're going to probably take something out of context completely. You're going to turn to Philippians four thirteen. God, is it your will for me to fly off this cliff? I can do all things through Christ. Yeah, you're going to do something. I hope you don't do that, but we may do something like that. So one of the big things I want us to look at when we're looking at the will of God is the Word of God. We're going to be looking at a lot of passages. They are going to be up on the screen. Uh, Corey was really happy when I showed him how many passages I had. Um, he's like, you're kidding me. Um, so 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 is our first passage. It says it's all scriptures inspired by God is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work, for every good work, completely equipped, ready to go, ready to attack. God's Word is authoritative. That's how God speaks to us today. Uh, if, you are fam- if you follow me on Facebook, you may see I con- sometimes will post from the Babylon Bee, which is a satirical Christian news site. And it puts just goofy stuff up, and it picks at everybody occasionally. But one of them it put up the other day, Almost, it almost wasn't funny because I was like, this is so true. We do this. And I had a picture of a guy at a coffee shop praying and his Bible was a few feet from him. And it said, man, three feet away from Bible prays that God will speak to him. And for those of you missing that, he's got his Bible closed and he's saying, God, speak to me. God speaks to us through His Word. That is the primary authoritative way that God speaks to us. I would even say this. For those of you seeking God's will, our graduates, anybody, you'll never know the will of God more than you know the Word of God. You want to know the will of God? Open the Word of God. Find the will of God. God didn't put you here without any direction, any guidance. He gave you His Word. If you've ever read the history of how we got God's Word, it's incredible what people went through. The amount of people who died. The the way these guys went about writing this and keeping this and preserving this. God had an incredible hand in this. We've got better proof that what we have today, 2,000 years later, is more accurate than Shakespeare's writings. I mean... That's, that's impressive. Shakespeare's writings are not nearly as old as this. And well, you have to read those in school. And Sorry, this is going wonky on me. There we go. Um, and we can see also we have different vocations. Uh, with your vocation, God uses you to accomplish His will. He gives you abilities. He allows you to hone those abilities in some way. God's will in, your, in His vocation is for you to bring Him glory. And I would even go as far as to say this in your vocation. Do what you do well to the glory of God. Do it in a place strategic to the mission of God. There's a missionary couple who uh, they'd moved off to, I'm forgetting where they went to, uh, somewhere in Africa. And they went to Africa to to live as full-time missionaries. And in this time, I must be messing something up, sorry. Um, In this time, they went and they moved and they're doing the work of God and they're, they're seeing some salvations, but things are moving kind of slowly and their infant child comes down with a sickness. Their infant child dies of this sickness. Come to find out, of course, this infant child would not have died had they been living in America. Had they been in America, this infant child would not have died. And they were later asked, do you regret it? You lost your child because you listened to God. No, we don't regret it. We know where our child is. 
We're secure with where our child is. He is securely in the hands of God. We are doing what God has called us to do, whatever the consequence, whatever the price may be. We will follow the will of God. And of course, we have different personalities that God has divinely given to us in order to bring Him glory. Some of you are talkers. Some of you are listeners. Some of you are thinkers. Some of you are go-getters. And yet, we all still have the same ultimate will, which is we've been called to pursue God. So the first thing we see is God's will is that we be holy. And we say that in Leviticus 20, 26. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and have set you apart from the nations to be mine. So why be holy? Because God is holy. That is God's ultimate will for you, to be made holy. Holy is, of course, hagiosmos is what we see that come from, but that is a state of being like God. A state that God calls us to, by the way, through His grace. You don't become holy without the grace of God. So to be holy is to be like God Himself. And it's, again, God's will to be made holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 for this is God's will, your sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. It's the process God takes you through. That you abstain from sexual immorality. This matters, I think. Being made holy, I believe, matters. It takes time. Spending time with God. All right? You want to be like someone? Spend time with them. See what they do. My uncle is a master of tying knots. I tie a lot. But not a knot, all right? I am terrible at tying knots. If you're like, hey, Scott, can you tie this for me? I can tie like two knots, all right? My uncle can tie 5,000 knots, and he can just do crazy stuff with them. He can throw a rope and make a knot show up in it. I'm not kidding. He can do that. If I wanted to be a master of knots, I would sit and watch him. I wouldn't just rely on myself and go, well, I'm going to figure this out eventually. Now I'm going to watch this guy. I'm going to be around this guy. Just like with being God. You want to be holy? Be around God. Seek God. Search God. See what God is asking of you. Do as God is asking of you. This passage isn't open to a great deal of interpretation. We get to that, well, maybe this passage is... No, it's it's pretty simple. God's will is that you be made holy. It's about as clear as it gets. So how do we accomplish that? Well, I know Romans 12, 1 through 2, tells us, uh, tells us that uh, to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing... This is our spiritual act of worship. This is our spiritual act of worship. It tells us even, renew your mind daily. Renewing our mind daily. Our mind wanders. Our mind goes all over the place. And God has called us to be holy. He has called us to give ourselves living sacrifice. And the other thing it also tells us in that passage, be able to test and approve what God's will is. That goes back to the Word of God. If you want to know the will of God, you can have, and there's, place, there's ways you can hear the will of God. The church is a great place, by the way. If you disconnect yourself from the church, it's pretty hard to find the will of God. Yes, you can find it in God's Word. You also find in God's Word it's the will of God that you be in community. Uh, just throw that out there for those of you who are, I can worship at home on my I've seen that too much. Um, yes, God wants you out. God wants you doing. But at the same time, God has called you to a community of faith. You want to know God's will, sacrifice yourself to Him. Trust in His ways, not the world's ways. And continuously renew and restore your mind. And once those are done, God's will is revealed to you. And it may not mean you'll finally get your billboard. It may mean that you're, you're so attuned to God's Word and God's ways that you just know. You know God in all things. You know God in all ways. Once again, you're never going to know the will of God more than you know the Word of God. Number two, God's will is that you live obediently. And I've just broken this up into a few things. I'm wanting giving. And that's Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? You're robbing me. You ask, how do we rob you? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You're suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. One of the coolest stories I heard from Easter Sunday was hearing that you know we weren't going to do an offering that day because we had so much going on, and hearing somebody actually said, that's part of my worship. Please don't take that from me. Like it wasn't people going, whew, thank goodness. That's money I can put in the bank this week. Somebody seriously said, that's my worship. Don't take that from me. Praise God for you, whoever you are. I don't know who said that, but that's awesome. 
That's our type of worship. And God has said, bring it to me. This, of course God doesn't need gold. I mean, who's going to impress God with money? You know, you get to heaven, you're like, look at my gold. They're going to be like, why are you carrying asphalt around, you weirdo? We walk on gold here. What are you doing? God has called us to give, number one, because He wants to show us what's right and do with just what little you give me. I mean, He speaks things into existence. Surely a goodness. He is not reliant on our money. But He uses our money. We have to have money. We have to use it. And then, of course, there's those people, well, Scott, you do know the New Testament doesn't really deal with tithing. I mean, it, it just kind of says give to God. And I, I respect that. If you really want to be a New Testament giver, uh, they give 100%. You want to give everything? I mean, I'd be okay with that. God called you to give. Give out of a pleasant heart. In fact, that's what we're called to do. Acts 4, 32 through 37. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and mind. No one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. And the apostles were giving testimony with great power to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distrib- distributed for each person's basic Needs Joseph a Levite and a Cypriot by faith, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. They gave. They gave not because, oh, I have to give. They give because they love God, because they want to worship God. There's not much else in this world besides another human being more precious than money. We have to have it. I mean, we do. That's a reality. You have to have it. And yet... We are called give it out of love for God. He gives us all. I, I used it. I, I grew up in a divorced family. And, you know, as a young child, when we would get a birthday gift for mom or a birthday gift for dad, guess who had to buy that? Their ex-wife or their ex-husband did. Okay, probably not a lot of fun to have to spend your money on your ex-wife or your ex-husband. But without that, we could not have even given a gift to our mom and our dad. And it's the same way God God gives to us everything and He calls us to give back. Hey, I'm going to give you 100%. I asked for 10% of it back, but what I'm even asking back from is, was mine in the first place. All you had was mine in the first place. God doesn't want money given out of guilt because it's the right thing to do. He wants money given, given out of a willing, sacrificial heart. The second in relationships or in marriage. And I see this in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? I get a lot of people want to fight you on this one. Well, if I just marry this person, I can change them. Don't try to make this so hard. God's given His will. Don't be mismatched with unbelievers. God's will in marriage is that you marry someone godly. That we marry someone who loves God like we love God. You want to know God's will for marriage? Read what a man or a woman of God looks like and pursue that. Students, young men who are single, young women who are single, seek that. Don't seek who looks the best, who has the best earning potential, who's got the best job, who's got the coolest job, who's got the coolest credentials. Seek someone who loves God. The rest will be fine. The rest will be fine. Number three in your vocation. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether you eat or drink, do what you do to the glory of God. At your job, are you doing it to the glory of God? Is your job a place to glorify God every day? Is your job a place to go, <sighs> I hate my life. I hate this job. You know, which one? Which one is it? Because they know if they know you're a Christian, They're looking at you. You may hate a job, and I guarantee you work with someone who hates their job. Guarantee you get a great chance to share the gospel with them when you say, you know what? This may not be the greatest thing. I may not love doing this, but I'm going to do everything I do well to the glory of God. And again, I would even encourage you to do it in a place strategic to the mission of God. There's a job that I had at one point. I was making a little more money than I was at another job, but I was working alone, all by myself, in the back of a warehouse. And it burdened me. It's like, I don't get to see anybody the entire day. I can't even talk to somebody about Jesus. I can't disciple anyone. And so I was like, I'm going to go to this other job again. Making less money. Because I really feel like this is what God wants me to do. Because the place I'm working is not strategic to your mission, God. Does your work, do your work as if it was work to the Lord. And that's Colossians 
323, do it enthusiastically even. Shovel a ditch enthusiastically. Change baby's diaper enthusiastically. Everything, do it enthusiastically as work unto the Lord. Paul even says something really weird uh, that a lot of people have actually ripped the Bible for, but if they would you know, actually read it correctly, they would see what it meant. Paul says, slaves obey your masters. Now, he is telling servants, because that was a position, servants, obey everything your master says and do it. How many of you have like, oh, don't raise your hand, but maybe you have an awful boss that you don't like dealing with. You're like, oh, he or she asked me to do the dumbest things. You wouldn't believe it. Paul would say, honor them and obey them. And you may be like, why? Why? You, you don't know this person, Paul. You're, you're dead 1,900 years. You don't know this person. And Paul would say, I get that, but I've seen some awful masters to their slaves, to their servants. And Paul is literally telling you, you're opening up a door to share the gospel. You're opening that door to share the gospel when you walk godly. Again, do what you do well to the glory of God in a place strategic to the mission of God. In trusting Him, God's will should you trust Him. God's will desires for us to trust that He's good and that He wants our best. I tell our teenagers all the time, when you get to that point in your life that you understand God is good, God loves you, God wants your best, it will change your life forever. Because everything that goes on, it's not, why me, God? Why are you doing this to me? It's, God, I don't know why you're doing this. This doesn't make any sense. But I trust you. I'm going to deal with this. Believe me, over the last year of my life, I've seen a lot of that. And at this point of my life, if I could go back to myself about a year ago, I would say, don't get mad. Don't scream at God the way you're going to. Trust Him. Trust Him in what's about to happen. If you trust God, you'll obey God. That's simple. If God says, I want you to do this, and you trust that He wants your best, that He desires your best, that He loves you, He's a good Father, you obey Him. God fulfills His promises. We just miss those promises sometimes because we become very selfish. And the third thing is God's will is that you make disciples. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and He said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. By the way, this is in every single gospel, including the book of Acts. I just chose that one. But it's in every single gospel. I need you to understand, this isn't simply leading someone to Christ and just walking away. This is teaching someone how to follow Jesus in obedience and in love. I, I mean, this, honestly, this is how silly we can look sometimes. Uh, as, and, and churches do it. And we've got to figure out how to fix it as, as church universal. We, we have, see someone come up, they give their life to Jesus, and we're excited. And we should be excited. That person has just passed from death to life. That person just went from an eternity in hell to an eternity with Christ. And they just walked from a life of loneliness and despair to a life walking with Christ. They are alive. And basically what we do is it's kind of like we tell them, congrats on being born. Now go and learn to walk, talk, read, and eat. And we'll see you once a week. That's what we're bad about doing in a church. We're bad. To give you an illustration of this, it's like you bring home a newborn baby, and a few of you have done that here in the last few weeks. And imagine you just brought this newborn baby home, and you know, you're know you showing around the house, you know, this is your bedroom, this is the bathroom, this is the kitchen, this is the living room. All right, well, we're going to sit down, and you put them in their high chair, or wherever you put them in, and you say, all right, I need you to hear something, little child, little baby. Uh, the fridge is over there. Instructions on how to cook dinner is on the fridge. Uh, the TV remote's in there. Uh, and we showed you where your bedroom is already. Mommy and Daddy are going to go do some things. We're going to have a good night. You take care of yourself. If you need us, call us. We'll see you later. That's what we look like when we watch someone come to know Jesus and then just say, congratulations. And we don't do anything to walk with them. We don't disciple we don't do that. Number one, those parents uh, would be in big trouble. Not because they're just bad parents, but that's bad. That'd be a horrible human being, right? Who would do that to a child? Discipling. But, but you may say, well, Scott, isn't that the pastor's job? Well, number one, I can't, Joey can't, effectively disciple 100, 200 people. Number two, if I read that passage correctly, God said, you disciple them. 
Great Commission wasn't just to two people. It wasn't just to two out of every hundred people in a church. It was to all believers. You want to live inside the will of God? Find a spiritually young believer. Get to know them. Spend time doing, spending life with them, discipling them, dealing with the hardships that come with a young believer, being loving yet being firm in some things, spending time dealing with patience with that person. And, and I'll just say this out of honesty. If you're a mature believer who is not discipling a young believer, then you are living in direct disobedience to the will of God. If you want to live inside the will of God, find someone you can disciple. Take the initiative. All right, you're the one who takes the initiative in that. Scott, it's not convenient. It's not convenient for me. Of course it's not convenient. It wasn't convenient for Jesus to go to the cross and die. It wasn't convenient for Jesus to be beaten to the point that he looked, even looked like a man according to Isaiah. He couldn't even recognize him as a man. He got beaten so severely. It wasn't convenient for Jesus to leave heaven it wasn't convenient for Mary to give up all her hopes and dreams as a young woman because this baby now is growing within her. Well, I'm not much of a people person. Well, Jesus was. You're called to be like Jesus. I love very much. You never know the will of God more than you know the Word of God. I can't believe... I, uh, nobody's ever going to talk to me after some of this because they're probably like, I talked to him about that. I can't believe how many people I hear say, well, I don't share the gospel because I don't know enough. I just don't know enough. Well, you have a copy of God's Word. If you don't, please let us know. We'll give you one. You have a copy of God's Word. Read it. Get to know it. You're not asked to have a seminary degree. You're not asked to be on a level of a PhD. Get to know God's Word. Just get to know God's Word. Teach someone what it means to walk like Jesus. Teach someone how to follow after Jesus. Get to know your Bible. If it's as important to you as you say it is to, get, uh, to lead people to Jesus, read your Bible. Get to know God. Get to know God's Word. That way you can adequately share the Gospel. Get to know the Gospel so well inside and out that you can bring it out in any situation. I don't talk well. I'm not a good speaker. God created the tongue. You don't have to give an eloquent speech. I use this example to teenagers. If you've got a crazy guy on a cliff who believes he's Superman, says he's going to fly, you can give him the greatest speech of mankind. You're not going to convince him he can't jump off that cliff and fly. But if you have the antidote, you can stick him with that crazy antidote, whatever that is, and he comes back to his senses, you don't have to share much with him to tell him, don't jump off that cliff. He's going to go, oh, no I'm not. That antidote is the Word of God, the Spirit of God. God has to work. You don't save. You can't save. You're not capable of that. God is. He uses you as His mouthpiece. He goes before you. He speaks to the heart. He softens the heart. And He alone saves. You become the mouthpiece. The obedient mouthpiece in that. It's amazing the, ra the rationalization we can make when God's will doesn't match our will. It's amazing the rationalization we can have. I hope we don't value convenience over the name of Jesus being known. I mean, again, going back to convenience, pick up your cross, follow me. That's not very convenient. That's the call of Jesus. Following Jesus is simply about having it easy and being convenient. You're following the wrong Jesus. And if I may say this, we're really good at methodically and meticulously planning our retirement. In the next 20, 30 years after retirement... Yet so many haven't made a dent in the next 20 or 30,000 years of dis by discipling. Please understand that. We meticulously, methodically plan for our retirement and 20, 30 years after that. And we, some have not made a dent in eternity. Please hear that out. There's a sermon I always listen to this time of year. And it's by John Piper, and it was considered a generation saving or generation changing sermon. And it's entitled Don't Waste Your Life. And in this sermon, he, he talks about tragedy. And he talks about two ladies. He says two ladies were living in Cameroon, and 
They're both right around 80 years old, never been married, obviously didn't have children. They spent their whole life in third world countries full of sickness and disease, sharing the gospel, making the gospel known. And he said, you want to know how they died? Because they were driving through a jungle and there was a cliff and they did not see it. And they went over the cliff. 80 year old women nearly in Cameroon sharing the gospel for a living, drive off a cliff. And he said, I asked my church, was that a tragedy? And he said, no. He said, here's what a tragedy is. And he said, I was reading Reader's Digest. Everybody remember Reader's Digest? I was reading Reader's Digest. And he said, and I was reading about a couple who retire, about retiring early. And here's what their retirement was. Now that they've retired, they've saved their money, they've they lived well, they made plenty of money. Their life is they go sailing and cruising on their boat, on their ship. They've got a boat, I'm sorry, not a ship. They've got a boat. They go from island to island collecting all the seashells they possibly can. He said, that's tragedy. Tragedy was we worked to save up for the last 20 years of life to go collect seashells on islands. Don't waste your life. Graduates, don't waste your life. Why do we disciple? We want others to know Jesus as Savior and learn to walk in the joyous path He called us to walk. We're not after our own legacy. We're after God's glory. And because, number one, you you make disciples because God called you to make His name known. But here's the cool thing. You alone cannot fulfill the Great Commission, which is why, again, the church is a very, very important place. Young people, don't neglect the church. As you, 80% of teenagers who grew up in church leave the church. We got five graduates this morning. That means four of them statistically will not be in church. That's terrifying. That's horrifying. Young people, if you hear anything even in that, the church is important to following the will of God. Because number one, they will walk with you. They will teach you. They will guide you. They've been there. But number two, you can't fulfill the Great Commission alone. You can't go to the nations alone. You don't have the money. You don't have the time. You don't have the resources. You don't have the time in your life. You don't have the lifespan to do that. Make disciples because Jesus died on the cross. He's called us to teach others how to enjoy living in the light of His sacrifice because He gave all. So you want to live in the will of God? Make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey all that He commanded. And finally, I'll I'll begin to close out with this. God's will for those of you who are not believers is that you come to know Him as Lord. Another tragedy is we live through this whole life, we spend time in this life. And at the end of it, you end up spending eternity in hell, that this is the best it gets. Jesus left heaven. I need you to know what a big deal that is. He had everything. It was perfect. There was nothing wrong. He willingly became hungry. He willingly became tired. He willingly dealt with frustrating people. Still willingly deals with frustrating people. Because He loves you. Because He does not desire for you to be separated from Him forever. And I'm talking to those who are not a Christian this morning. If you do not know Jesus, He has one will for your life right now. That is you surrender your life to Him as Savior. Do you look to Him, look to His death on the cross and say, that's mine, that's me, I need that, I deserve that, that's what I should be, but for some reason He's up there instead of me? True faith in walking with Jesus, those of you who don't know Jesus, is this. It's like jumping into a pool and you don't know what's in there. And you just scream out, Jesus, I don't know what's about to happen. But I know if you don't catch me right now, I'm going to die. I'm going to perish forever. His faith in Jesus is saying, you are my only hope. I'm done. I'm done for without you. I'm done for without you. So I'll close with this. and It's Proverbs 3.6. And we'll have Corey and the band start coming up. And I almost... It's a weird word to use, but I almost, almost see this as a contract. First line of his yours. Think about him in all of your ways. In pursuing the will of God, think about him in all of your ways. Whether that's vocation, whether that's marriage, whether that's what you're going to do each and every day in your life. And he will guide you on the right paths. 
Follow him in all of your ways. Think about him in all of your ways and he will guide you. That second part's his part of that contract. He will follow that. He will lead you along the right paths. God will hold his end of the contract. Will we hold ours to think about him in all ways? Not just you graduates, but everyone. Because I hope you as a Christian are seeking the will of God. And I hope you understand that number one, the will of God is a position to even be in. God wants you to be holy. God desires you to be holy. So there's a couple things I want to invite you with today. Number one, I I want you to just be praying about what what is God's will for me right now? And, And a lot of that may be seriously, where am I missing the mark with God? What part of my life is not lined up with God? That's part of His will for you. Number two, what is the will of God as a, as a parent? What's, my will, what's God's will for my life? I can tell you that, but I really need you to be praying about that if you're a parent. God's will is not a Where's Waldo game. It's not missing. Right? God's will is in front of us. God's will is a position to be in. Third, if you've got a graduate, and we'll have time to do this in a minute, but I, I pray you're praying for them. pray you're spending time in prayer as they prepare for the next chapter of their life. They're going off. You're going to be sending them somewhere. Maybe it's community college. Maybe it's there somewhere. It's, I, don't, I mean, I know it's not yet, but sending them hundreds of thousands of miles off. What's God's will for you in this time as you send your student as you send your child to college. And finally, if you're that person this morning and there will be people up here to talk to you, Joey and I will be up here, we can talk to you about it. If you are not a Christian this morning, the will of God is that you surrender to Him this morning. We can talk to you about that. So I invite you this morning to come forward as you seek what the will of God is in your life. Where you need to be. How God's calling you to be right now. Are you in a place where God's using you? Do you need to get in a place where God's using you? Are you making disciples? Because if you're not, I need you to be praying about who God is calling you to disciple. This is a great morning to begin seeking a person that God would have you disciple because God will answer that prayer. God will make that so clear to you who He wants you to disciple. Maybe you're, again, maybe you're just frustrated with the job. You just need to pray, God, I need just some calmness, just some peace about my job. I need you to be with me every day of my job. We need to be praying as a church about that. Everyone who is in a place where you're serving, because you are serving God in that place. And again, finally, you don't know Jesus. Pray that you would come to know Him this morning and we can show you how to follow Jesus this morning.